This is a good day to come here. Um, we have also special guests in the house, Sam Cabra, as well as Rachel uh, Morley, who come all the way from Oahu to be with us this weekend in the Pacific Northwest. We're so honored to have them here. Uh, Sam is the senior pastor of a church called Reunion Hawaii. He is also the director of Kingdom Living Oahu, which is an apostolic hub revival center tr to train, that's created to train and equip and to send uh, believers out into their spheres of influence to bring heaven to earth. Um, and so there's just a lot that's going on there with them. These are fiery revivalists whose heart is for his presence, whose heart is to bring heaven to Oahu, to the islands, and I know also into the nations. And so we are so excited to have them here today. We want to go ahead and welcome up. If you guys want to give Pastor Sam a warm welcome as he comes. We also want to, Pastor Sam, you come. <laughs> So, Pastor Sandy, we're going to say a blessing over you. Okay. Well, I've, let's see, about 20 minutes I've been in your atmosphere. I got here about, I like it. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good start. So, Father, we just thank you for this man. We thank you for this son. We thank you for this new friend to the house here at SRC. And we bless him this morning, Father. We just say, Father, we just receive all that he is, all that you've done within him, God. Every gift, we call him a gift to the cosmos. We call him a gift to the cosmos. And we just receive, Father, from him this morning. We bless, Lord, the, the work of his hands, the kingdom work there in Hawaii as he's just suffering for Jesus on the beach there, Lord. Um, and we just pray he'll bring us and invite us one of these days to come with him. <laughs> But God, we, I just thank you, Father, that he's uh, one that gathers and guards and sends. And we bless the gathering, the guarding, and the sending in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Aloha. Aloha. Uh, take a minute. I need a second to set up here. But turn to your neighbor and ask them, what in the world is a kraken? I have no idea what that is. You probably already know. What is the correct answer? I, I literally don't know. An ugly sea monster. Sounds godly. I love it. All right. I'm excited. We're excited to be here with you guys. Thanks for having us. Um, news about you all travels across the Pacific, and we've heard all kinds of wonderful things. I met Darren through a mutual friend. You probably know Richard Gordon. He introduced, oh, a lot of woos in the house. Yeah. Hey. Big fan, as Richard would say, big fan. Um, Richard introduced us, and Darren and I just stayed in touch. We had Darren speak to our full-time ministry school, Kingdom Living, um, through video call, and it was just so fun. And we wanted to come out here and just see what Seattle Revival Center was all about. It was originally a plan just to hang out in the Pacific Northwest. We'd never been. This is like one of the most beautiful places yeah, I love it. It's, it's unreal. Thank you for not having hot summers. This is such a fun trip. Um, and it was a surprise because about a month ago, Darren said, hey, while you're here, why don't you speak at all three services at SRC? So I said, yes, let's do that. I like that idea. Uh, I love Darren. He's such a fun guy. What, a, what an amazing teacher, yeah? What an amazing pastor. Do you feel loved by Darren or what? Yeah. He's great, and the, the man exudes joy to an extreme, and like if you're going to exude something, let, let it be joy, you know? He is so fun. I love him, um, and I want to honor you guys. How many of you have been at this church for more than 10 years? Real high, real high. Yeah, I want to honor you all specifically because when Rachel and I walked in this morning, we felt such a legacy and a history with the Lord here, and... Uh, I know a little bit like uh, Darren's father was here and then Darren's grandfather was here and I think the church even existed a little bit before that. So there's some years under the belt of SRC, but man, it's oily in here. And 
we, we really feel the presence of God and that's something that's stewarded. It's not something that's like a lightning strike and I just wanna commend you guys for stewarding his presence so well. It's really important and it's really the main thing. That's why we're here today. So thank you guys. Um, thank you, Darren. Thank you, Roy. Thank you, team, for being just awesome. Can you guys just thank the tech team? Tech teams are so underappreciated. Yeah. Um, Darren's in the middle of an interrupter series. I'm gonna, series, I'm gonna interrupt it. Yep. And so I, you're looking at a six foot one prop. I'm his prop today of interrupting. Um, I also wanna, can you guys just give it up for the worship team? Wow. Yeah, and I wanna, I wanna just brag on Rachel here. She's, she's my favorite, she's my spiritual daughter. And um, y you know, some people are talented, other people are anointed, and there's a big difference. And Rachel's probably the most anointed worshiper I've ever been around in my life. And I know you guys caught a, a glimpse of that today. Um, go check out her music. It's streaming on all the music sites. Uh, she's got a couple of albums out there and a new one coming down the tube. So make sure and check her out. Yeah. Way to go, Rachel. Way to be awesome. So, yes, uh, I'm the senior pastor of a church called Reunion Hawaii. It's in Honolulu. It's beautiful. It's everything you would imagine about paradise with traffic and bugs and sunburns. It's beautiful. No, I love Hawaii. It's it's where God has called us, and it's my favorite place. Um, I also run a ministry school called Kingdom Living, as Faith was saying. And whether it's our church or our school, we really do only have one goal, and I want to talk to you guys about that one goal, and it's simply this. It's to equip the church, and who is the church? Yeah, you are. Not SRC, but you, the people who make up SRC. You're the church. And our goal is to equip the church to see his kingdom come and his will be done on Oahu as it is in heaven and hopefully spread out from there. And we treat that as a very literal statement. That's not a metaphor, that's not poetic. And when our students are done with kingdom living, we want them to look and act and think like Jesus. That's the goal, is that people look at them and have to take their glasses off and say, is that Jimmy or is that Jesus? That's, that's the goal, that's what we do, that's what we're in this for. And it's a nine month school and you know, we tell this to students on day one, you will see incredible miracles, you will see signs and wonders and healings, you'll see deliverances, you're gonna get so much doctrine and theology pumped into you, it's gonna be great. But to me, this is the fruit, this is the part that matters, this is the heart behind what we do, is that people, when they're done with kingdom living, they fall in love with Jesus. It really is that simple, it really is the goal, and what we've tried to do is just create an environment that ministers to him first. He's the prize and he's the reward. Yeah. And if all we get at school that day is him, then that's all we need. Yeah. We've had a lot of people come through the school, senior pastors, soccer moms, doctors, lawyers, and, and the most recurring testimony that we get is they say, this is the thing that changed my life forever. This is the thing that transformed me. And repeatedly, over and over, we see students paying for other students. To, like this, they'll say, I just graduated. You have to go next year. Let me pay for your tuition. You need to be in this place. This is likely the, the, the best investment you'll ever make. And, you know, families transformed, marriages restored, all these wonderful things. Can I tell you guys some testimonies? I like testimonies. Do you know why we tell testimonies? Because they're prophetic in nature. And what he's done once, he'll do it again. And... Um, in the first service, I got halfway through before I remembered to say this. But if, this, if you have any of these symptoms, just receive these. They're for you. Okay? These aren't for me. They're not even for God. They're for you. Like He's done these things so that you can hear about it. And it can raise your expectancies for what he's about to do. So every year at Kingdom Living, we have a couple of weeks. We call them healing weeks. And we teach on healing, we get the students activated in it, and on one of the nights, we open it up to the community and we invite, we tell all the students, invite a guest that night. And we get, you know, it's not uncommon to have people from 30, 35 different churches in the room on any given night. And when they all invite a friend, now you've got a wide variety of religious backgrounds, all, all Christianity, obviously, but like, man, you've got some, you got some some spread, you know? And 
A lot of the people who come honestly don't believe in healing, and they'll come with their arms crossed and ready to tell us why this isn't for today and to poke fun at us and tell us all this stuff. And you know what happens every year during healing week? The people, the guests who don't believe in healing, they get healed. And how many of you know that if you don't believe in healing and then you get physically healed, you start questioning whether your doctrine and theology is accurate, you know? So I wrote down just a few of the testimonies from this year. We, I mean, we've seen hundreds, literally hundreds of people have these radical things. And I, I just want to tell you, getting healed of a cold is just as radical as stage four cancer. We've seen both. We've seen body parts fall off of people. We've seen body parts appear on people. But there's, there's no hard things for him, and there's no small things for him. Um, so some of the things that happened just this year is there is a... A lady, she was probably in her 40s. She was a college wrestler decades ago. And she had some move put on her and it broke her collarbone and it never was adjusted. They left it out of place. And so her collarbone was actually pointed downwards because it didn't cause her any problems and they didn't require surgery. So she was actually one of the people who didn't really believe in healing. She knows maybe in Africa or South America, God will do that. But they prayed for her, and as she was praying, her collarbone literally shifted in her body and popped back into place, and she felt it pop. And she was pressing on it, and it wouldn't move anymore. She couldn't get it to move. That'll, that'll make you question whether your beliefs are right, because <laughs> you have a decision to make. We had a girl, uh, a YWAM girl, who was there as a guest, and she had a, I think it was hip displacement something, where her hips were out of alignment, and one of her legs was literally twisted inward, so her knee was facing like at a 45 degree angle. And when they prayed for her, um, it, her whole leg just shifted and it popped and she screamed. And you hear a lot of screams during healing nights because people are shocked and it's hopefully the good screaming. But she, she couldn't believe it. She's walking up and down the aisles. Her, her legs are in alignment. And, and the thought is like, well, what did you expect when the healer is here? You know, that's not a scolding, but if that's who he is and that's what he loves to do and that's his nature, if that's his promise to his kids, what do you think is going to happen when you pray to the healer? Uh, we had all kinds of things happen. Herniated discs come back into alignment, vertebrae moving. We had someone's vertebrae uh, actually shift. She felt it pop over. Uh, I guess they were out of alignment and one popped back into place. One of our full-time students, his mom came, which was a big deal because she thought he's like in this weird cult school and who knows what they're teaching my son and healing isn't for today. And she comes in and one of the things that we're um, known for within our circles is that we actually have a really, um, we've cultivated a culture of worship and extravagance and lavish, he's worth lavishing love upon. And when this student's mom walked in the room and she saw this, uh, she didn't believe it. She thought it was fake. And she was telling her son, the student, like, this isn't real. They're all faking. They're all actors. This isn't God. And as the night progressed, somebody laid hands on her. And I guess it was her back that she had had chronic pain for years and years. And when someone laid hands on her, her back came back into realignment and the pain left her completely for the first time in years, years. Yeah. God likes to heal. Yeah. We had people give us testimonies that fear, actually like a spirit of fear came off of them, sleep disorders, chronic anxiety, PTSD, uh, demonic oppression. We saw eyesight restored. I love, I love eyesight and hearing. Like when people have to throw away their hearing aids or get new prescriptions or throw away their glasses. Like that, that's what Jesus likes. That's who he is. You guys, does anybody need healing? Check your bodies. If you're healed, wave your hands. Like he, this is, he's Jehovah sneaky. He will get you when you're least expecting it. But seriously, I'm not joking. Like test your bodies out if you feel like you got healed. Um, I want to show you a quick video. Uh, just to see an inside peek of Kingdom Living, our ministry school. Uh, let's put it there on the screen. His kingdom, His kingdom is, here. is here. On Oahu as it is in heaven. On Oahu as it is in heaven. Reaching every tribe, spoken in every tongue, and proclaimed in every nation. This is our call. Sons and daughters, 
that carry the kingdom to all spheres of influence, causing demons to flee, sickness to faint, blind eyes to open, a flood of freedom, life, and joy. Raise your expectations. We pursue His agenda, His voice, His call to change the world. Our goal is Jesus capturing His eyes to act like He acts, to think as He thinks, walking in supernatural signs, wonders, and miracles. Your transformation changes the world. Kingdom breakthrough. Kingdom breakthrough. Kingdom, Kingdom come. come. Kingdom, Kingdom living. living. Yeah, just as a disclaimer, we don't wear masks anymore. Hawaii was way late to the no mask party, and we actually don't wear them anyways, but the facility we were meeting at demanded that we did, so we played nice and we wore them. But don't, everything looks the same, but no masks anymore. So just imagine that, like, free-flowing without all that garbage. Okay. I love the church. My heart beats for the bride. It's, it keeps me up at night. I, I love the global church. I love the local church. And um, because of that, I, I'm blessed and honored to be able to speak to a lot of different churches and do fun stuff like this. And when people come to check out Reunion or to come check out Kingdom Living, they'll, they'll see this culture of freedom. And they'll, from a good heart, they'll say, hey, how do we create this? How do you get this? How do you transfer this? Like, what's the formula? And... I know that what they mean, and I, this isn't a correction, but I want to tell you the same thing. I wish I had a better, a better answer, but the short answer is that we simply give him priority. We literally just give him the agenda, and we literally treat him as the star of the show. And we do come with our agenda, but if he has a different one, we change ours. And I know what my preferences are, but if he has different ones, we change our preferences to meet his. And we've, what we've done is we've structured things very purposefully so that if God doesn't show up, we're in big trouble. And you think I'm kidding, but come to a Kingdom Living staff meeting and understand just how, how reliant we are on him showing up. And so this morning, this is my first time talking with you guys. I love you. You guys are good looking. This is a good looking church. Darren has recruited well, apparently. But what I wanted to talk to you guys about, what's been on my heart is this. I love being your guest today, but there's a greater guest of honor here. And I need you, I'm not asking you, I need you to turn your affections to him right now. I need you to recognize him as the star of the show and the guest of honor. He's in the room, and you have the opportunity to lavish your love upon him. You can listen to a guest speaker today, or you can lavish him with love, and there's one that he wants more than the other. So literally, I don't care if you open your mouth, I don't care if you close your eyes, you need to stir your heart right now to encounter the king. Tell him how worthy he is. Tell him how beautiful he is. Tell him how perfect he is. Tell him how glorious he is. Jesus, we welcome you to SRC. Nothing else matters. You're the only one in the room that matters. Welcome him. Adore him. No one controls your affections, but you prioritize his presence because he's why we came. He's the one. We won't rush past him. He's here. And I hope you didn't come to church to hear an amazing worship team. I hope you didn't come to church to hear a pastor preach. He has to be our selling point. He has to be. Because everything else fades away. Everything else is a lesser reward. Anything else that we prioritize will get burned up. One of, one of the things that we've become known for, like I said, is um, a culture of worship. And I don't mean just good musicians or talented musicians, because we do have those. There's a difference between talent and anointing. And I would, people say this, 
but they don't really mean it. I would rather have a very anointed worshiper with an out-of-tune voice than the most talented worshiper with an out-of-tune heart. And I hear a lot of amens. Be careful, because I'm going to preach at you here. And I think that a lot of believers don't truly like to worship. We just like the worship experience. It, it's fun. We like talent. Liking the musical part of church is easy, but worshiping him is costly. I didn't say singing is costly. I said worshiping him is costly. And this was a while back. The Lord just started speaking to me and saying that throughout history, there have been too many alabaster jars that have remained unbroken. And that's not okay. And those jars are sitting on altars of convenience, of altars of pride, of altars of self-preservation, and altars of thinking that any of this is for us. I love you guys, but I didn't come here for you. Darren loves you, but he doesn't come here for you. There's one that we come for. And if we're not careful, we'll start to consume worship instead of become worship. Big difference. I've, I've spent most of my adult life, up until the past five or ten years, five or six years really, um, spent it on a stage holding a guitar in worship bands. And both sides of my family for generations are worshipers and musicians. And music is everything to me. I love it. It's such a part of my life. It's part of my ministry to the Lord. And this was a while back, probably 10 years ago. The church that we were at, it was a small church. And the Lord started moving through worship. And people started coming from across the island to encounter the freedom and the beauty and the presence of the Lord. And again, we were small, small, like 100 people on a good night. And yet we had worship leaders coming from all these giant churches across the island. And they would tell us, I've never encountered the Lord like this. I, I, I have to come to this, even if it's just for a fill up so that I can go back and release this. But I didn't know he could be this real during worship. And I can remember nights that... You know, tiny little room that we're jammed into. Every seat is filled. There's people lining the aisles on the floor, sitting, sprawling, laying everywhere. And on some nights it was so crowded that the line actually went out the door and down the cam highway. And people were literally sitting out on the street asking each other, what's happening in there? What are they talking about? What's God doing in there? And that's wild to me. And we began to see God do wild things during worship and bodies would start to get healed without people coming and receiving prayer just because the healer was in the room. And for a season, we had a collection of braces and you know, walking boots and crutches because people would come to worship and they would leave healed. And I, I just remember watching people take off their braces and throwing their crutches aside and literally dancing out the door, singing and shouting because God healed them. Listen, God's really good at his job, and he needs a lot less help than we think he does. There were, I, I remember times when atheists and agnostics would come, and they would get saved during worship without anyone telling them, you need to get saved, you need to say the sinner's prayer. They would actually encounter the man of Jesus, the beautiful one. And they would... I remember this one guy who is an atheist, he came to church, and why do you think atheists come to church? Because God's attractive, even if you're an atheist. And so he came to church, and during worship, he encounters Jesus, and he, he comes to us after worship, he says, I don't know what happened, but I just met Jesus, I gave my whole life to him, what do I do now? We started seeing broken bones get healed during worship. No one praying, we saw ACLs, MCLs, meniscuses, torn, or torn ligaments, everything just healed. We saw deaf ears pop open and blind eyes pop open. That was the first time I'd ever been around that in person. And I learned really quickly how 
easy it is for him and how eager he is to do those things. We saw lifelong illnesses, sicknesses melt away at the name of Jesus. We saw Lyme's disease go away. We saw cancer literally fall off bodies. We saw STDs that were healed. Scoliosis, so many backs were straightened. And it was just because we gave space to the king. Like, let's not overcomplicate this, guys. It's tempting to overcomplicate it. And man, I love to talk into a microphone. I love to teach. But during this season, I, I kept coming, I was growing in the Lord, and I just kept coming back to this question why is this surprising that this is happening? Isn't this what we should be expecting? And if he is who he says he is, shouldn't we be more surprised if these things didn't happen? And so we started saying this, that our expectations have been far too low for far too long. And that we have to start raising our expectancies. And so I'm asking you, what did you come here for today? I'm so happy you're here. <laughs> this isn't a spanking, I promise. I love you. This is happy, Sam, believe it or not. Like, I'm happy to see you. But did you come to have church? You can have church. Or did you come for the beautiful one? And you can have the beautiful one, but you get to pick. During that season of time, I started reaching out to anyone and everyone that I knew in ministry, whether they were pastors, on worship teams, janitors, whatever. If they were working for a church or associated with a church, I was contacting them. And I sent them all these uh, text messages and all these emails. And I wrote this question. I said, in two sentences or less, can you explain why people would want to attend your home church? And I really wanted to know. This wasn't a setup. But it ended up being a setup. But, but I didn't mean it to be. When they responded, I started getting these amazing answers. People started writing things like community, fellowship, my church has amazing resources, great teaching. I love the home groups at my church. My church has childcare. My church is welcoming. They genu genuinely want to know you. I feel welcome there. I get fed at my church. And they said, my church is inspiring. Let me tell you, those are all good things. How many of you want all of those things at your church? I do. Those are wonderful. But I probably got, I don't know, 80 or 100 responses back. And I could count on one hand how many responses actually required God? How many responses actually pointed back to him? Now listen, don't hear me, don't, don't mishear me. We need those things. But I don't want the reason to come to SRC because you have amazing childcare and you have amazing childcare. People need to come here because you have the one thing. The woman at the well, right, when she met Jesus. So she ran and told all of her friends, come and see a man. That was the selling point. Come and see the man. I, I don't get to preach this without walking it out because I'm a senior pastor and I get to make these decisions and I'm the director of a ministry school so I get to make these decisions. And let me tell you, this is much easier preached than done but I feel like this is something that we've gone out of our way to set ourselves up for failure if God doesn't show up to our services, to our school. And we started asking ourselves, what do we do on a weekly basis that actually requires God to show up? Do we actually need him? to come this week. Because I'm telling you, us Christians, man, we, we're, we're excellent at not needing him. We're excellent in knowing how it's done. We're excellent in figuring out the church formula. And I'm not opposed to formulas, but formulas can't be the one thing. Listen, we join in what he's doing. He doesn't join in what we're doing. And that means sometimes our agendas are wrong. 
That means sometimes our plans aren't going to fly today. We don't move chairs and make more space for him in the room. We give him the room. And I'm telling you, you don't have to be on your church leadership team to do that. You can do that at your house. You can do that sitting in your vehicle. You can do that at your job. You can do that at school. Give him the room. One of the things that the Lord is doing globally, corporately, in the capital C church today is that he's refining worship. Worship has never been a secondary issue. It's never gone away. It's never been a byproduct. It's always been a central thing. But what he's doing now with worship is he's purifying it. Specifically for us out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, what he's been telling us is that the show is over. And, you know, we have a lot of friends in a lot of different worship communities across the United States. And they're, they're saying the exact same thing, that they're seeing the same thing pop up where performance, places that were interested in pleasing man with the performance, they're dying, they're drying up. And what I think he's doing corporately is that he's, he's turning hearts and stomachs away from this performance culture that makes an idol out of man's attention and man's affection. And, and again, I said this a little while ago, we found this out, that God is so attractive. He's so attractive. And if you can get him to show up, you don't need to get people to show up. They'll come on their own. It it blows my mind that we've invested so much time and energy and strategy and effort into getting man to show up and almost no effort into getting God to show up. Who do you want? You'll get who you want. And it breaks my heart to see that we've made worship about us. And a lot of you guys probably know um, who Don Potter is, and I've had the opportunity to hang out with Don a few times. That, that guy's changed my life. What a prophet. What an amazing guy. And one time we were sitting in the most sacred of environments at Olive Garden, and <laughs> we don't have all, oh, we just got an Olive Garden in Hawaii, so it's like a big deal to eat at Olive Garden. Chick-fil-A, Olive Garden, God's country. Anyway. Back to the story. Quit distracting me. Me and Don, we're at Olive Garden, God's country. And he said this. He said, Sam, worship will cost you everything. And Don's one of those guys where I never understand what he means the first time. And it's not for months or years later that it finally clicks. And I understood he wasn't talking about money. But what I started figuring out is that worship is actually the most costly thing that we can do. It's the most valuable thing that we can give him. And you know, being, I, I'm so privileged and I love it getting to speak at so many churches and events and conferences and, and all these pastors always come and say, yeah, Sam, we always do our songs first in the service order. And I just, I want to tell some people like doing songs first is not the same as worshiping him. Listen, we like the part of church that ministers to us. The sermon, this part. But we don't care so much for the part that ministers to him, the worship. He's coming for the worship. And you know what happens is we've created cultures where it's okay to show up 30 minutes late for church because you're just missing worship. But don't, don't show up past 945 because that's when Darren starts preaching. And you don't want to interrupt Darren. You don't want to interrupt Roy. Psalms 22.3 says that God inhabits the praises of his people. And that word inhabits, it means he abides in, he lives in, he's enthroned upon the praises of his people. And what struck me about that verse is that it doesn't say God inhabits the sermons of your pastor. And it doesn't say that God inhabits the songs of your worship leader. It says he inhabits the songs of his people. Who's his people? You. So when people say, oh, I, I always skip my church worship, it's so weak. 
Do you know why it's weak? Because you're not there giving him a throne to sit on. Oh, I don't like our worship team. They're out of tune. Oh. It's not their job to create a throne. It's yours. And if you're not happy with that, I better stop. This isn't my church. Oh, listen. Okay. <laughs> God will inhabit. He'll, he'll bless things that he doesn't inhabit. And let me tell you a quick story. Uh, my pastor told it to me when I was a kid. And this happened years ago, probably 80 or 100 years ago. There was this pastor in this community. Everyone loved him. Everyone loved him, wanted to be around him. And he was a, a very, very large person, like close to 400 pounds. And back in that day, communities sort, sort of rallied around churches. So if you lived near a church, that's the church you went to. You know, they didn't have the ease of transportation that we do. And so what he would do throughout the weeks is he would go house to house and knock on the doors of all of his congregation and talk to them and be with them. And people loved him. They never wanted him to leave. He's just, he made them feel loved and supported. He was just a beautiful man. But what they noticed was that with some houses, he would stop and go in and stay for hours, have dinner, hang out, talk, you know, hug the babies, do all the stuff. But with other houses, he wouldn't even go inside. He would just bless them and keep going. And finally, one day, somebody asked him, hey, why do you do that? Why, why do you stay so long at certain people's houses and not others? And he said, well, he said, I'm a big guy. And when I come to a house and they open the door, when they open the door, the very first thing I do is I look around their house to see if there's a chair that's big enough for me. Because I've sat on a lot of chairs that have broken and it's so embarrassing for me, it's so embarrassing for the person whose house it is, I, I don't wanna do that to them, I don't wanna do that for me. So if, if I see something that'll support me, I'll go in and I'll hang out and I'll be with them. But if not, I'd, I'd rather not stay there and I'll move on. And I think that's how God is with us. Where he's actually looking for a throne that's big enough for him. And he will bless things that he doesn't inhabit. And I think that the Lord is absolutely lifting his hand off of churches and ministries that have a disregard for his presence, that are flippant and, and treat him as optional. And so we have to ask ourselves, are we creating him a big throne? How big of a throne do you want him to sit on? Again, God doesn't come to church for our preaching. He comes for our worship. The preaching's for us. Do you think God is learning something right now? Do you think he's taking notes during my sermon right now? He doesn't, I don't think God gets much from our preaching. He's given us his spoken word. He's given us the written word. But it's the worship that's valuable. It's the worship that's costly. Did you know this is the only time in eternity that we can give him a sacrifice of praise? You can't give him that in heaven. Oh, I don't feel like worshiping. Then don't go by your feelings. Give him what he's worthy of. It's a sacrifice of praise. Mm, mm, mm. You didn't tell me your church was such slow listeners, Roy. I want to I talk to you guys very quickly about um, tabernacle versus synagogue worship. What's the last book of the Old Testament? Malachi. What's the first book of the New Testament? Matthew. Between Malachi and Matthew, historically, there was 400 years, 10 generations. And the Bible says that during those 400 years that nobody heard the voice of the Lord. 400 years. We have a pity party if we don't hear him during our morning devotionals, you know? Like, oh, I haven't heard him in over a half hour. I'm, what's, have I sinned? They did not hear him for 10 generations. Great, 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 great grandparents. Think about that. Silence. In the Old Testament, um, there were two temples and one tabernacle. Moses had a temple, and then David had a tabernacle, and then David's son Solomon had a temple. Come to Kingdom Living. We'll talk all about these things for nine months. It's awesome. But it was during that 400 years of silence between Malachi and Matthew that 
the temple and the worship in that tabernacle actually shifted, and that's when the synagogue actually developed. And there were major differences between temple and tabernacle worship and synagogue worship. David's model was absolutely our model. Oh, I wish we had another hour. I want to talk to you so bad about David's tabernacle. Next time, next time. The purpose of worship in the tabernacle was to minister to the Lord. Always. That was why you went. And when you went to minister to the Lord, you did it in one of three ways. You either worshipped him, you made an offering, or you prayed. And the expected outcome was encountering him. It wasn't that the Lord could be here, we just don't know. No, he, his tangible manifest presence, the Shekinah glory of the Lord was there. And you knew he was there. You could feel him. The purpose of the synagogue that developed in those 400 years of silence, synagogue, you went to the synagogue to be ministered to. To hear the word through teaching, to get your needs met and to fellowship. Those aren't bad things, but they became the main thing. And ministering to man replaced ministering to him. In the temple, the teaching, the activity, it always led to an experience with God. Not in theory, but actuality. God-focused encounters. And the byproduct, or sorry, the sole concern was to give glory, was to give worship. And the byproduct was that you received from him. But in the synagogue, teaching and activity always led to discussion and debate about God. You didn't go to meet God. You went to talk about him. It was very man-focused. The point was to receive. It was to be entertained. It was to get your needs met. And I'm, I'm just here to tell you that there are so many churches out there that reflect the synagogue instead of the tabernacle. There's lots of content and activity. But if you're running short on time, guess what gets cut? Worship. If we're running short on time, cut the worship. Why? Because we think that church is about us, and that part's not for us. Let's just get to the sermon. We like the part of church that ministers to us, but we forget about the part that ministers to him. Who's the star of the show? It's not optional to create a culture of worship. When we gather, he has to be the reason why. He has to be the selling point. Because that's something that will never tarnish. He'll never fade. There is no shifting shadow. I want to know about God. I love academia. I love academic Christianity. I have multiple degrees. I, I, I learn every day. I'm a reader. I'm a voracious reader. I want to learn. But I'm going to tell you something. An encounter is far more important than learning. You can know all you want about him, but when he looks at you, it would be literally the end of your world for him to say, get away from me, I never knew you. I never knew you. Yeah, but God, I knew all about you. I know you did, but I never knew you. What's more important when we come? For us to feel stirred or for him to feel stirred? Why are we here? Who is it more important to make feel included? Us or him? Whose preferences are more important? Ours or his? Yeah. You guys are good at pop quizzes. I want to tell you guys a, a short story, and we'll get out of here, and you can get your kids from Kids Church. And let me preface it by saying this. This is actually a Rachel Morley story, who you should all go stream her music. Did I mention that? You have two albums out, a third on the way? I think I did mention that. Okay. But if I didn't, go stream Rachel's music. Um, I think Rachel said this a while back, um, where the Lord was just pressing in on her and said, if I took all of this away and you only had me, would that still be enough? Would that still be enough? So 
during um, that season where the worship was just, we were known for our worship. And I think we still are, but this was just a very unique season 10 years ago. Um, because people had never encountered the Lord like that during worship, we would often get outside worship team members ask if they could sit in and just be a part. Like, can I just play my guitar with you guys? Can I join the team for a night or whatever? And um, so we would oftentimes have people from outside churches come and sit in just because, like, if he gives you something, it's for you to give away. You know, like your, your anointings, your giftings, it's not actually for you. It's for others. Your breakthrough is so that others can have breakthrough. And so we really took that to heart. And so we would try to get others involved. And one night, our worship leader uh, brought a guy. He was a guitar player. I was a guitar player. But because he was a guest and had never been in this environment, um, he asked if he could sit in. So I said, sure. So I jumped over to bass. I told some really bad bass player jokes in the first service. I'm glad we didn't record that. All the bass players are writing me nasty emails now. Um, but I jumped over to bass so he could play guitar. And I'll, I used Roy in the first service. I'll use him again. So this new guitar player, his name's Roy. Uh, we're excited because I love seeing people hit the encounter. You know what I'm talking about, the encounter, where they actually realize, oh, he's real. Oh, he's here. I'm not playing for people. I'm playing for him tonight. And so we get set up, and we actually didn't practice. We would just worship, and that was our practice leading up to the church service. So we started worshiping, and I'm sitting there plugging away on bass, and Roy picks up the guitar and starts playing, and he's terrible. He's awful. And he's hitting, like, even the wrong notes you didn't know existed. He found them. And he found them with such diligence and accuracy, it, it was unreal. And I'm sitting there thinking, I'm looking at the worship leader who invited him, like, what is up with this guy? You know, this is really bad, really bad. And church starts soon. What's up? Did he practice? Did he know the set list? So we're plugging away, and he's just beyond terrible. And I'm putting my head down, like, whatever, we, we'll get through this. And so we get done practicing, and I come to the worship leader. I'm like, is he okay? Like, what is up with this guy? He, this is not great. And she said, ah, I've played with him a hundred times. He'll, he'll get it. He'll figure it out. You know, and as musicians, that happens sometimes. I, I get that. He'll get it. He'll figure it out. So it was only like five or ten minutes before church started, so I figured I trust her. She, she believes in this guy. Church starts, and guess what? He didn't figure it out. He was, he was more terrible during the worship set than he was during the worship practice. And I mean, like, to the point where I'm giving him dirty looks, you know, like, my guy, my brother in Christ, you, you did not practice this week. And this is, I, I've never been on the performance side. I don't, I, I'm so uninterested in performing. I'm not going to impress man with my skill, and I'm not going to impress God. I do believe in excellence. I think God, there's excellence in the kingdom. And so my heart that night, I wanted to protect this environment at my church that the Lord had just exploded in this worship arena and yet, here's this guy who's like our guest. We're giving him the privilege of playing. He didn't practice. He can't find a right note. And I'm getting really upset with him. And at that time, what we would do is we'd have a short worship set to start the night for like 15 minutes. And then we'd have the sermon. And then afterwards, we'd have the big worship set for anywhere between 30 and 90 minutes. We would just go. And so we get through the first, first worship set, 15 minutes. It's awful. Thank God we only had to do 15 minutes. And we go and sit down and listen to the sermon. I'm hot. I'm angry. I'm so upset that our worship leader would invite Roy. He clearly, I don't think he's ever played a guitar in his life, to be honest with you. And so I, I get out my phone, and I'd never done this before. I wrote out a text to our worship leader, and I said, I don't think we're supposed to do the second set. This isn't working. Like, this is terrible. And I actually felt like it was going to dishonor the Lord if we got up there and made this spectacle, like joyful noise. It was a noise, all right. And I'm looking at this text, and I just felt a check in my spirit not to send it. So I put my phone down, sermon ends, and we go back on stage. And I wish I could tell you a happy ending, but he played worse for an hour. Just, I mean, I don't know. It, no words can describe the terrible sloppiness. 
So what we do, what, what we still do, but what we did back then is at the end of the church service, we'd get in a big circle and we called it circlebration. And everyone would go around and just say one thing that they saw God do during the night because we always want to bring it back to what he's doing, what he's been up to in the room. We never want, like if he's doing something, he's worthy of that celebration. We want to celebrate it. So I started the meeting, which meant I would get to share last. And I was going to just rip this guy a new one and say like, you know, like clearly we didn't host his presence well tonight. We didn't prepare and, you know, diligence and excellence. And so the person here starts going around. Everyone starts talking about like what they saw God do. And I didn't realize, but Roy was sitting right next to me. So that means he was about to go second to last. And then I was going to go last and kind of, you know, be mean to him. I wasn't trying to be mean. I was just, I was just embarrassed. Like, how could we do this to God kind of thing? So we go all the way around the circle, and Roy, it's Roy's turn. What did God do? And he said, listen, guys, I just, I'm so grateful that I was here tonight. This is such an honor. He said, this has been a terrible week for me, just brutal. And he told us all this stuff that happened to him that week. And he said, all I had to look forward to was coming tonight. And then he said this. He said, this was the greatest night of my life. He said, I never have encountered the Lord like I did tonight. And his exact words were, I will never forget the way that he met me tonight. This was it. This was the greatest. This was the highlight of my life. And as he's saying that, I'm just torn in two with remorse. I'm like, oh God, what is wrong with my heart, you know? And I just, I felt terrible. Because here I am expecting this guy to I guess, perform, not realizing that this was the moment for him. This was the moment. And so after, you know, he went and then it was my turn. I was, oh yeah, we loved having you, you know, come back next week or whatever. (laughs) And I felt terrible and I'm wrapping up cables, we're cleaning up. And the Lord said to me, he said, Sam, and he's talking about me and Roy. He said, Sam, one of you came tonight to have church and one of you came tonight to encounter me. One of you got what you came for. And that was it. That was the lesson. And I'm telling you, I never want to learn that one again. Can you guys stand with me for a minute? We'll close this up. I want to, I want to encourage you. Um, we need to lose the fear of man. We need to lose the fear of not sounding perfect. We need to lose the sound, or lose the fear of making a joyful noise before the Lord. Um, because I want to tell you something. That night, the Lord delighted in Roy's terrible guitar playing. And and I'm just gonna be honest with you, the Lord could care less about my fantastic bass playing that night. One of us got what we came for. And I never want to be in an environment where we don't get what we came for. But that means we have to come for the one thing because he will never leave us, he will never forsake us. He really is that simple. Can you guys hold out your hands like you're gonna receive a gift because you're gonna get a gift? And just pray with me. Father, I bless this house, this, the legacy that is on this house, the generations that are in this house. I uh, just speak life over this house, life to the full, life abundant, that your future is brighter than your past, that greater things are in store for you, that he delights in the sound of your lips. Don't rush past him. He hungers for your voice. He hungers for your authenticity. Uh, So I speak a worship breakthrough over this house that people would come from thousands of miles just to get a glimpse of what you're doing in this house. And I want to tell you, worship is more than musical stuff that they would come just to see you worship him, just to sit at his feet, to pour it out, to break that alabaster jar. He's worth it. And so, Jesus, we proclaim that you are the prize, you are the reward. There is nothing else that we came for. Thank you for your yes. Thank you for coming to meet us. Thank you for always being faithful to us. We bless your name. Amen. 